In this lesson, you will learn how a battery management system measures temperature. It turns out that the operational characteristics of battery cells depend very strongly on temperature. For example, the electrical resistance of a battery cell is often quite low at warm temperatures and quite high at cold temperatures. And this means, in part, that we can get more power out of the battery cell at warm temperatures because of the lower resistance than we can at cold temperatures. And so the BMS needs to know what are the temperatures of its cells in order to be able to compute power limits and also to be able to accurately compute estimates of state of charge and state of health and so forth. It also turns out that the rate of degradation is a strong function of temperature. Battery cells tend to degrade much more rapidly at warm temperatures than they do at cold temperatures. And when the battery management system is controlling the thermal management system, it needs to know the temperatures of the battery cells in order to do so properly. There are exceptions to the general rule that degradation happens most quickly at warm temperatures. For example, at very cold temperatures, we can have extremely rapid degradation if we attempt to charge a battery cell. You will learn more about this in the fourth course in the specialization when you learn about state of health estimation. But you will learn that a phenomenon known as lithium plating can happen, which very quickly degrades the cell and can even result in a safety situation. So it's common not to charge lithium ion battery cells when the temperature is colder than about zero degrees Celsius. We also measure temperature because some unexpected change in temperature can indicate a cell failure or some kind of impending safety concern. In an ideal situation, we would measure temperatures internal to every single cell in the battery pack, but that would require a temperature sensor somehow inserted into the packaging, and that's not really feasible. So we have to instead depend on temperature sensors that are somehow mounted external to some of the cells. And also because temperature sensing is relatively expensive and because temperature differences across a well-designed battery module are relatively small, we often use only a few temperature sensors placed at strategic locations in a battery module or a battery pack. And we use a thermal model we have developed of our battery pack in order to interpolate and extrapolate among these measurements to come up with estimates of the temperatures at every cell location. In the previous lesson, you learned how a battery management system can measure voltage using an analog to digital voltage converter uh, circuit. It turns out that there's no circuit that can directly measure temperature. Instead, somehow we must come up with a means to convert temperature into a voltage that's related to that temperature, and then we measure the voltage using an analog to digital converter. And in this lesson, you will learn about two different technologies for measuring temperature. The first is to use a thermocouple. A thermocouple is made from placing two different metals in contact with each other, and these different metals actually form a kind of a miniature battery. A chemical reaction is happening at the surface of this bimetal barrier that produces a small voltage. The voltage that's produced by this thermocouple turns out to vary with temperature in proportion to the temperature difference between the thermocouple and some other reference temperature at a different point in the circuit. Now, this voltage difference is usually very small on the order of microvolts, but it can be amplified and measured in order to form a, a voltage that I can convert into a, a, a temperature reading. A design challenge when using thermocouples is that we must have a calibrated reference temperature against which we're comparing uh, the measured temperature. And some integrated circuits can generate this reference temperature internally, but otherwise we need to have an externally calibrated temperature source which is not feasible in a battery management system. So overall, in my opinion, thermocouples are best suited for laboratory testing when we can have all of the necessary temperature references and equipment on hand, but they're not especially well suited for production battery management system designs. But uh, while we're here, I show you a photograph uh, that illustrates a thermocouple-based temperature sensor.
uh, the wand on the right of this uh, this instrument houses the two different metals inside this long pole and uh, this is connected through some standard wiring to the packaging on the left and inside that packaging there are electronics necessary to produce the reference temperature and to amplify the signal and to produce a display of the temperature for the user to observe. An alternate approach to measuring temperature uses a component known as a thermistor. A thermistor is a special kind of resistor. All resistors turn out to have value that changes somewhat with respect to temperature, but most resistor designs are, are done such that this temperature variation is minimized. A thermistor, on the other hand, is a resistor that has been designed to maximize the change in resistance as a function of temperature. There are two varieties. One is called a negative temperature coefficient, or NTC thermistor, and it has resistance that varies inversely with temperature. The other kind is called a positive temperature coefficient, or PTC thermistor, which has a value that varies uh, proportionally with temperature. So if we were able to measure thermistor resistance, then we could infer from that measured resistance what the temperature must be. But we can't measure resistance directly with an electric circuit. Remember that we can measure only voltage directly using an analog to digital converter. So somehow we must convert that resistance into a voltage that's measurable. And by the way, the photograph on the slide is simply showing a collection of thermistors so that you have some idea what they look like. So I need a way of converting resistance into a measurable voltage. And the most common way of doing this is to use a circuit that's known as a voltage divider circuit. I've drawn a schematic diagram of a voltage divider circuit on this slide. And in this circuit, the top resistor labeled R1 has a resistor, a resistance that is not changing very much with temperature, but the lower resistance labeled R therm has a value that is designed to change significantly with temperature, and this is the thermistor. The circuit is supplied with a constant known voltage V at the top of the circuit, and the analog to digital converter measures the voltage drop across the thermistor, which is labeled V therm. When we begin to analyze the circuit, the first thing we do is to compute the current that passes from the voltage source to ground. And our assumption is that the analog to digital converter draws essentially no current, and so we say that the current into that A to D device is zero. So then we can use Ohm's law to say that the current through the two resistors connected in series is equal to the voltage drop across the resistors divided by the overall resistance, or I equals V divided by the sum of the two resistances. Again, by Ohm's law, we know that the voltage drop across the thermistor is equal to the current through that thermistor multiplied by its resistance. So we can combine these two equations to find that the voltage drop across the thermistor is equal to the overall voltage V multiplied by a scale factor. And the scale factor is the thermistor resistance divided by the sum of the two resistances. Now in the circuit, it turns out that there's always going to be current flowing from the voltage source V to ground. And power is being dissipated through this circuit as I squared times R, where I has been computed already and R is the sum of the resistances. And we don't want to, you know, this power is, is parasitic. Uh, we don't want to waste all this power. And so we would like to minimize then the amount of current that flows. So we design the value of R1 to be relatively high in order to minimize the current. But we also have to balance that requirement with the requirement of providing a measurable voltage at the thermistor. So it, usually the value of R1 is similar to the thermistor resistance at some reference temperature like 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that's done in order to minimize the overall power loss, but still to provide a measurable voltage in the voltage divider. So our desire is to measure the voltage across the thermistor and to use that voltage to be able to calculate the resistance of the thermistor. So we take the expression on the previous slide and we rearrange it to solve for the resistance of the thermistor. Uh, 
When we do so, we find that the thermistor resistance is equal to R1 multiplied by a scale factor, and this scale factor is the voltage drop across the thermistor divided by the difference between the source voltage and the thermistor voltage. The data sheet that documents the specifications of the thermistor that you purchase will give you an equation that relates the resistance of the component to temperature. And this turns out often to be an exponential relationship like the one shown on this slide. Uh, in this equation, we see that the thermistor resistance is equal to some reference resistance R0, which is measured at some reference temperature like 25 degrees Celsius. And this reference resistance R0 multiplies an exponential term. And the exponential term has an argument that is related to the differences in reciprocals between the measure temperature and this reference temperature where this difference is scaled by a device parameter, beta. Uh, this equation is really fundamentally designed to work with temperatures in Kelvin, and so the 273.15 factors converts Celsius temperatures into Kelvin temperatures for this equation to work properly. Let's look at an example of how this might uh, work out in practice. In this example, I'm using a negative temperature coefficient or NTC device that has a value of R0 equal to 100 kilo ohms measured at the reference temperature of 25 degrees Celsius and it has a beta parameter equal to 4282. The plot that you see on the slide shows resistance of the thermistor itself as a function of temperature and you see that there's a very wide range from over 2 mega ohms at its highest point to essentially no resistance as the, the temperature varies. In the second plot, I show what the measured voltage would be at the analog to digital converter if we use the thermistor in a voltage divider circuit where the R1 value is equal to 100 kilo ohms and the supplied voltage is equal to 5 volts. At extremely low temperatures, the thermistor resistance is um, very high and essentially all of the voltage from the 5 volt source is dropped across the thermistor and none across R1. And so we measure a voltage that's close to 5 volts. On the other extreme, at very warm temperatures, the thermistor resistance is essentially zero. And so the voltage drop across the thermistor is essentially zero. And so most of the voltage will be dropped across R1. And so the measured voltage across the thermistor is essentially zero volts. At the reference temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, the value of R1 and the thermistor resistance are equal. So half of the voltage is dropped across each of the components. And so the measured voltage is half of 5 volts or 2.5 volts. And overall, the, the profile of measured voltage versus temperature has a sigmoidal shape. And when we plot it, we see that there's a fairly linear region between about 0 degrees and 50 degrees. And outside of that linear region, it does tend to curve more. So some very simplified designs rely on this linear shape if they don't require a very accurate temperature sensor. And they just fit a straight line to the central region. But if I want a more accurate calibration, I, I simply do a table lookup of the, the actual design values, which is also quite easy to do. So for this more accurate temperature measurement, we can invert the relationship in the second plot to compute the relationship shown in the plot on the right, the third plot. All I've done is to interchange the temperature and the measured voltage axes and replot the data that way. And this again gives me a lookup table so I can store a vector of measured voltages and a corresponding vector of temperatures and anytime I read a voltage I can look in that voltage vector and find the closest value and then look up the corresponding temperature. So for example if we measured 4.0 volts we can go to the lookup table and find uh, 4.0 volts in the temperature uh, in the voltage axis rather and then we draw this vertical line and notice where it encounters the blue line and then uh, the value of the blue line by drawing um, a horizontal line there is uh, the point in temperature that we're measuring. So lookup tables are extremely efficient in terms of computation, even though they do require some memory to store all of these values.
So to summarize this lesson, you've learned that we must measure and control cell temperature to preserve battery health and to provide critical information to our algorithms that compute power and state of charge and state of health and so forth. It's generally too expensive to measure the temperature of every individual cell in a battery pack, so instead we measure several temperatures inside of a module or inside of a pack using sensors placed at strategic locations, and then we use some kind of interpolation and or extrapolation scheme to estimate what the temperatures must be for every cell in the battery pack. There is no mechanism that allows us to measure temperature directly, so instead we must somehow convert temperature into a voltage, and then we must measure that voltage using an analog to digital converter. Uh, and you learned about two different approaches. Uh, we can use a thermocouple with an amplifier, but there are some drawbacks to doing that that involves complexity and expense. The other method would be to use a thermistor with a voltage divider circuit instead, and that's what's most commonly done. So that brings us to the end of this lesson on how to measure temperature. And as we continue on in this week, the next thing that we're going to look at then is how do we measure electrical current? And that's the topic of the next lesson.